This fresco was inspired by the Council of Florence in 1431, during which clergymen and leaders from across Christendom were invited to attend, and as you'd expect, you'd see a peculiar mix of people. Obviously there's French, Italians and the likes, but there's also the Bulgarian Patriarch of Constantinople, Joseph II, and along with him, the Byzantine Emperor. Then scanning over the image you'll see that there is clearly an African. This isn't a slave or a servant or anything like that, in fact this is a member of the Ethiopian Embassy to the Council, which again, just to remind you, took place years before the Europeans travelled to East Africa. But the shame is, if you google African explorers, you'll more than likely just find a collection of Europeans exploring Africa. However, if you dig a little deeper, you can find Africans crossing the Indian Ocean and arriving in China in the medieval period, and even Africans arriving in Europe during the time of the Crusades. In fact, if you were to Google Ethiopia today, you'd probably get a lot more results about the modern conflict that is tearing apart the north of the country, specifically the Tigray region, but also threatens to envelop the rest of Ethiopia in a brutal civil war. Should you be interested in finding more about this and the origins of the conflict, then check out my video on the history of Ethiopia, as well as specifically the origin of the Tigray conflict. Thanks very much for having me in the video, Jabsy, and enjoy the rest of this one. Travellers moving between the continents in the ancient world was pretty commonplace. There's even Roman descriptions of the coast of East Africa and early Christian communities in India. Plus, in China, there were the Nestorians. But what I'm focusing on here is the medieval world, after the rise of the Islamic empires. Now, when others point to Africans in the medieval world, they maybe look at the African trumpeteer John Blank, who arrived in Tudor England. But he arrived after the age of exploration had begun in the 1500s. Or sometimes I see people list the legend of the Black Knight in the stories of King Arthur. But this character, Tom A. Lincoln, was added to the story around 1600, and was said to be a descendant of Prester John, the mythical Christian king. But sticking to the period between the rise of Islam and the age of exploration, you will find Muslims in every country from China to Spain. But Christians in Europe were seemingly cut off from the world beyond, including from the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia. This is when stories of Prester John first began to appear. This Christian king who allegedly ruled over a vast empire and would join Europeans in crushing the Muslims. But I only say seemingly cut off because there are little nuggets of information in medieval documents that show a more connected world, just like the Council of Florence and the Ethiopians who attended it. Now these Ethiopians came on the invitation of the Pope, who sent a couple of Italians to Ethiopia to meet with Emperor Zaro Jacob. Alberto de Sartiano left Rome and travelled to Alexandria, which was then ruled by the Mamluks. He travelled with Tommaso Balacci, who had tried to travel around that area a few times, but had been captured by the Turks and even spent some time as a slave. However, they didn't even need to make it as far south as Ethiopia, as once they were in Alexandria, they met a number of Ethiopian monks who claimed to act on behalf of the emperor. But they were probably more than likely from a sect known as the Ewostatians, and had no real authority to speak on behalf of the emperor, as their religion wasn't really accepted in their homeland. But they did have a presence across the Middle East, and these would have travelled to Europe from Jerusalem, but we'll just put a pin in that for a while. As one European at the council then recounted, on the 16th of August 1441, came to Florence about 40 Indians of India Major, sent by Prester John. Between them were three ambassadors of the most illustrious Prester John. They were black and skinny and quite different from posture of the type here. They came to Pope Eugene to make a union of their faith with ours. So here you'll see that Europeans at that time didn't really see a difference between Indians, Ethiopians and the likes. And this makes looking into some old sources particularly difficult, as sometimes anyone from Africa may be given the blanket term Ethiopian. And de Sartiano was even given the title of Delegate for the East, which included everything from Jerusalem to Ethiopia to India. Plus, the Pope included, fully believed that these were representatives of Prester John, and constantly referred to the Ethiopian Emperor by that name. But strangely, however, it seems that the Ethiopians were somewhat happy just to play along with it, describing their home country as larger than a hundred European kingdoms and the likes. One Ethiopian named Nicomedius wrote to the Pope saying, If only one will be the faith, God will kick our enemies out of Jerusalem, Holy Land. He will disperse them like the grains of teff in the wind. 
by the strength of our God Jesus Christ, and not by our strength. Finish what you started. Furthermore, the way to our land through land and sea is deadly dangerous to the Franks. We Ethiopian, after many torments, can now go among Muslims because of the strength of our king. The Muslims cannot argue with us. The king can destroy them without much effort. Here, he is right in saying that Ethiopians were living in Mamluk lands, but obviously they're slightly embellishing the power of Ethiopia, which, in less than a century, will need Portuguese help to fight off an invasion from Adal. Plus, this was not the only time that the Ethiopians were looking for an alliance with the Europeans to fight against the Muslims. A few years before this, in 1428, we know that Ethiopians arrived in Valencia and proposed to create an alliance with Aragon. This may have been a result of the Ethiopians hearing news of the Reconquista, and King Alfonso V of Aragon was keen to pursue this alliance. So he sent ambassadors to Ethiopia, or the land of Prester John, as it was again called right away. We know quite a bit of the conditions of the alliance based on Alfonso's instructions to his ambassadors. These included, they have to present to him also the masters of waterworks, and later tell him the intentions of the aforesaid Lord King, his good and kind dispositions in the facts of this enterprise. In case they receive a proposal of marriage for the Infante Don Pedro, they must inform Alfonso concerning the personality of the lady. So the Ethiopians clearly asked for some irrigation experts, and the King of Aragon was willing to marry off his brother Peter, the Count of Albuquerque, to the daughter of Emperor Yeshek of Ethiopia in order to bond this alliance. However, the ambassadors and engineers never made it to Ethiopia, and we can only take a guess at what happened to them. Emperor Yeshek, by the way, was the son of Emperor Dawit, and he also sent diplomats to Europe at the beginning of the 15th century. These arrived in Venice in 1402, and according to the Lord of Padua, Francisco Novella de Carrara, they brought with them a number of exotic gifts. This included spices and furs, and apparently the hide of a wild man, which we can assume would probably have been an ape or a monkey or something like that. There's also reports of three Ethiopians entering Rome a couple years later, hoping to acquire indulgences and relics on behalf of their country. What's strange in these two reports is that all the meetings seem to include a great deal of laughter. The Ethiopians laughed when the Europeans read from their Book of the Three Magis. Apparently this book perfectly described the land of Ethiopia, but on hearing the contents, the Ethiopians moved closer together laughing and greatly enjoying hearing what we knew and appreciated about them and about the names of their dukes, princes and popes. Of course, this book on the Magi had nothing really to do with Ethiopia, so maybe they were laughing at the inaccuracies of it. Otherwise, De Carrara described seeing the hides presented by the ambassadors with hilarity. So, the first unambiguous visits by the Ethiopians came around 1402, and then this brings me back to the Holy Land, as Ethiopians had maintained a presence there for centuries. For instance, on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, there's the Monastery of Deir es Sultan. This is home to monks from the Ethiopian Church. Now, when this became an Ethiopian monastery, it is hard to pin down, but it seems that it could go right the way back to the 12th century after Saladin recaptured Jerusalem. But first, I should state that when entering this period in history, everything is muddled, and sometimes sources can be frustrating. As you may have already guessed by now, there are very limited sources from Ethiopia, so we're depending on descriptions from Europeans. And to give you an example of how frustrating sources can be, we can look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. 883, Sigelhelm and Ethelstan took to Rome, and also to St. Thomas in India and to St. Bartholomew, the arms which King Alfred had vowed to send there when they besieged the raiding army in London. And there, by the grace of God, they were very successful in obtaining their prayers in accordance with those vows. So, maybe Alfred sent ambassadors to India, and apparently they arrived there. But did they actually arrive in India, or was it somewhere else? What did they bring back? How did they even get there? There's so many questions with some of these sources. Well, the same can be said about the Ethiopians in the Holy Land. One man who is incredibly important during this time is Emperor Lalibela. He famously built the Lalibela churches in Ethiopia, and these were supposed to be the second Jerusalem, and depending on the source, some say he merely saw Jerusalem in a vision, while others say before becoming emperor, he lived as an exile there for 25 years. So when Saladin took Jerusalem, Lalibela began construction on these churches, hoping to create a second Jerusalem for the pilgrims. 
Plus, after Saladin captured the city, some sources say that the Ethiopians were allowed to return there and establish their monastery. However, whether or not the Ethiopians can be found before Saladin captured the city is hard to say. But what does make this more interesting is that around the same time, letters from Prester John began to appear in Europe. But even though I can't prove that the Ethiopians were in the Holy Land at the fall of Jerusalem, you can find Nubians further away in Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. According to Robert of Clary, and while the barons were there at the palace, a king came there whose skin was all black, and he had a cross in the middle of his forehead that had been made with a hot iron. The king was living in a very rich abbey in the city, in which the former emperor Alexius had commanded that he should be lodged, and of which he was to be lord and owner as long as he wanted to stay there. This is probably Moses George of Mercuria, the Christian king who ruled in the lands between Ethiopia and Saladin. He spent a lot of his rule fighting against Saladin and would often brand Muslim messengers with the cross. Robert later says that, the emperor asked the barons, do you know, said he, who this man is? Not at all, sire, said the barons. I faith, said the emperor, this is the king of Nubia, who is come on pilgrimage to the city. There are also some Byzantines like Eustasio of Thessaloniki who recorded Ethiopians at the court of Emperor Manuel I in either 1173 or 1174. So it seems that East Africans were in Constantinople around that time, and we can now see how Crusaders met Africans. And there is also a story of Ethiopians arriving in Europe to meet with the papacy in Avignon in 1306. This comes from the works of Jacopo Filippo Foresti, who wrote decades after the event. He wrote, Indeed it is known that this emperor, Prester John, in the year of our Lord 1306, sent 30 delegates to the king of the Spains, and let it be known that he was offering him aid against the infidels. They also came to Avignon to present themselves reverently to Clemens V. But this account is now largely believed to be made up, based mainly on legends of Prester John, rather than an actual event. However, I would say that contacts between the two Christian communities long predates this account, and it was largely the Africans who were exploring at the time. However, unfortunately, we know so little about their journeys, but what we do know is Africans made their way to the heartland of Europe decades before the Age of Exploration. Then, maybe they were in the Holy Land in Constantinople in the 12th century, and more likely, even beforehand. Meanwhile, going east, there was of course the likes of Ibn Battuta and many other Islamic merchants who went to China. There were in fact so many Muslims during the Yuan dynasty that there were Islamic rebellions in the heartland of China. But there is someone who I do feel like mentioning, Said of Mogadishu. The Somalian explorer made his way over to China in the 14th century and began translating Chinese works. Later on there were reports of black samurai in Japan and even Africans fighting in the Japanese armies during the Imjin War, but these largely came with the Portuguese as slaves originally. There were also some Africans who rose to prominence, albeit later, in India. There the Ethiopians and other East Africans are called Sidi, and one named Malik Ambar became Prime Minister of a Sultanate in the 17th century. Otherwise there are tales of people from Mali going out west to America, and I may be wrong in doing so, but I just put that down to fantasy. This is because there's only one account, and it talks about Mansa Musa's predecessors going out on the Atlantic Ocean, and never been seen again. It's so vague that anything could be made from it, and some historians just cling on to the fact that the Spanish and Portuguese and the likes refer to some Native Americans as black. But the same could be said about Europeans who travelled south in medieval times, like Fandino and Ugolino Vivaldi, Genoese sailors who tried to circumnavigate Africa. Just like with the Mali expedition, they disappeared, and where they arrived is up for debate, and there are even some reports of their descendants living in strange places. For instance, over 150 years later, another Genoese named Uso de Mari travelled with the Portuguese to Guinea. There he wrote about the incredibly rich Christian lands of Prester John, and, also, the descendants of Vivaldi's, speaking with the Genoese dialect in the middle of Africa. But we can maybe take it all with a pinch of salt. And just before I finish off, I feel like mentioning the Kingdom of Congo. Now they didn't travel to Europe in medieval times, but they quickly converted to Christianity, and after the Portuguese arrived in the area, they began to send diplomats to Europe. One was Emmanuel Nevunda, who unfortunately died just two days after making it to Rome. 
he would have arrived in the early 17th century, just a few years before Hasekura Chunanega. So it was a strange time for Rome. But for over a hundred years, the kings of Congo were a powerful force, often seen as equals in the eyes of the papacy. Many Congolese would in fact join holy orders. So you can see on this painting from Lisbon around that time, you see Africans riding horses through the streets of a European capital. Plus their capital city, Sao Salvador, was fortified and larger than many European cities at that time. Plus just look through images of their kings. Many of these images are clearly fanciful of course, but you can see that this was a borderline Europeanized African kingdom, with coats of arms, holy orders and the likes, and well worth some further investigating. And this brings me to my question today, have I missed out any explorers or sources that you believe I should have highlighted? Leave them in the comments below. 